All right, Dave, I appreciate you being here, sir. Um, as we were discussing before, I love the background. I love the hat and I'm ready to jump into this. I am too. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, hello to everybody out there. And uh, yeah, peace and love. Let's just get right to it. Absolutely. Um, I did want to start here though. When, when did you um, get the name Farmer Dave? When, when did that come into your life? Believe it or not, I was uh, in more of your capacity at one point. I was a college radio DJ, a Ooh. program director at KXLU. So it was a radio nickname that stuck and permutated over time. And also, a little known fact for you and the fans out there, uh, it, it the name actually came not from... I have a grandfather who grew up on a farm. I've actually lived on a farm, but this all came from an ill-fated ant farm that I had in college. I like to blame campus mail because, you know, you order something. The U.S. mail has a certain amount of time, and then the campus mail has time, and then the student has to check their box. So what I'm saying is you buy the ant farm, send away for the ants, who arrive in a kind of a cryo freeze and mine didn't they lived for a while but then it got to be a little bit i guess you'd say kind of stranger things they it got pretty gruesome so it was a bit of a joke that this ant farm was a little bit of a calamity that's great i, d I didn't think it was going to turn to an ant farm scenario but that is that is interesting i was all, i was thinking about that i was like i was like oh maybe you know spending some time on, on a farm or something no you're curating your own farm within a dorm room yeah and also i had a co-host originally named cultivator devon and uh farmer dave stuck i don't think anybody's called him cultivator devon for a very long time is he still Cultivator Devin to you, though? If you were to talk to him right now, would you be like, "That's there's a Cultivator right there? I think he has too many other merits. Uh, we we might have mentioned it in passing, but he's gone on to do a lot of cool stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's one of many distinctions for my friend Devin. Well, I mean, good, good on it. Man of many hats. Yeah, absolutely. Say, hey, where <laughs> are you right now? Are you on the East Coast? No, West Coast, Orange County. Oh, great i was born down there Ooh, very nice yeah it's yeah. A, I, I i like it. what what part of orange county i lived in newport beach and my Ooh. mom taught at costa mesa high school for a long time very yeah my dad was a fireman in pomona and when my mom came out from indiana looking on a map pomona looked close to the ocean so she took a job teaching there and they got together what and then uh, they had me out at the beach that's nice did your did your father live with you in newport beach as he would work in pomona there was something to that i think it was a little before i was born him and a couple other firemen became some of the first active firemen to not live in the same town they uh. they busted out to the beach which in the 60s and 70s was a pretty cool idea and uh yeah, I'd say it, it worked out well for everybody. Uh, my parents separated. Uh, my dad was based out of uh, Laguna Beach most of my childhood, and then he's been in Mexico forever, which is great because I have people down there to go hang out with. That is great. That's a that that's a good deal right there. Yeah. Um, and your your grandfather was a was a farmer. You said. Um, he grew up on a farm, one of six kids, and ended up being actually a state trooper. He, oh wow. He, he he grew up a farm boy, but uh, he was actually part of a dragnet trying to catch Dillinger. They didn't even have uh, CBs in the cars yet. You had to pull over at a farmhouse or somewhere to use the phone and get the latest. It was a good time to be a bandit, I would say. Sure, sure. It's that's it's kind of prime time. It's not it's not like that anymore. I'd say I, I think you're in the wrong business if you are a bandit nowadays, but you know teach its own i you know it's you, you hate to see a, a a trade die really you know you don't want to see it go to the wayside yeah but kind of <laughs> like just somebody running off a cliff because out of habit you don't want to see someone try to be a bandit right now that would just be sad it's true it's true i think to me being a bandit right now 
is having the heart of a pirate, but being in the Matrix still. Like, I don't know about you, but when the internet really started blasting, maybe around the time Facebook and everything, everyone was getting a little bit upset. To me, it was like, let them have everything about me. I'm not going to, I'm just tired of being illegal anyways. Like, no more secrets. Just mysteries for me now. The, the the transformation from secrets to mysteries dude, that's that's a tough one that's that's a that's an issue I, I i i'm trying to ascend to that i haven't yet i'm still i'm still deeply embedded in the secrets but one day <laughs> mystery will take over and i'm looking forward to that day <laughs> cool man yeah um but do you currently live on a farm i i, th- I think i read that uh in, no. in an article okay um i did I, I got out of the world for a while and lived in Ojai in a commune type of a thing. But now I'm in a beautiful house in a sunny Ventura and I've I've got music, you know, got my bands and uh, also going to graduate school. Ooh, whoa, for what? What is what is the uh technically the... clinical psychology and then uh for me uh two of the areas I'm hoping to they call it a population would be uh musicians mental health. And I've also gotten into some surfing therapy. I'm training in that, which is super cool. That's awesome. That's a good. That's a good deal. Not a not not a bad place to be. And then if everything else fails, I mean, you, you could be a a burglar. You know, that's that's in in a in a in a runner of the law. Um, hey, and then just bring that tradition back. The, you're revealing the secrets. Man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not that's not a uh, no. There's it that market saturated. Don't don't be joining that. That's that's too. No it's more too hard burgling. to get a job. <laughs> we have a respectable storefront. Anybody can see it. You know, check out LinkedIn. Let's let's be friends. That's right. With Zuckerberg too. He's he's also on there. Yeah. No burgling under any circumstances. <laughs> um what did were you ever intrigued by your by your farming uh during that time in the in the commune up uh, uh, over there? Yes. I almost sort of made a deal with myself, like, I'm going to go back into the Matrix, back into civilization, but I know this exists. You know, sometimes, like, when rock stars, like, end their lives and things like that, you say, why didn't they just, like, go to Uruguay? Or why didn't they just die without dying? And that's kind of what, I hate to say that that's what farming is to me, is, like, I'm out of here, but it just, if you get your feet in the earth and you're planting things like some plant that you grow is just as famous as Kelly Clarkson. It doesn't need a million likes to prove anything. Like that's kind of what farming is to me. It's like, it verifies the truth. Even Ashton Kutcher in the Steve Jobs movie, he's like, pruning some flowers and they're like come back you know we want you back at apple but he's like clearly got his genius mode on with some plants it, yeah. it's there when all of our hopes and aspirations kind of like dylan won't you come see me queen jane all our sand castles aren't working out you can always plant something and grow it that but even then it's like whoa the bees are getting sick or your neighbor used roundup there is that you know and even if you try to go deep into the mountains you might find some survival nuts with a bunch of rifles like you can't just grow anything and not be part of the ills of the world but the point isn't that as much as to just be present and to enjoy what's possible and you know we want to contribute to the good side of things i guess what i'm the reason i was making those somewhat dire examples is just I wouldn't want you to think to me farming is escapism. What is escapism to you? If you well, if if you had to pinpoint it for your life. That's such a good question. I would say Appreciate historically uh, in my adult life psychedelics have allowed for that. Sort of a conscious escapism cuz you know you although you could go so far as to like take off all your clothes and throw your money and run through the streets that that might get you into trouble but you know you might not be in the pub taking swings at people it you know it, it's it's almost like better living through chemistry could be escapism and i've seen that work uh, i've seen that work for whole groups of people but really i think 
that's what I was saying about not having secrets anymore. Uh, it's not so much as escaping for me as uh, personally wanting to make reality palatable, you know, without escaping. And then the escape is like, for me, jumping in the ocean. But it's not, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes it seems like I have 300 emails in my inbox, no matter what I do, the piles of emails, even for charities. It's like, save the whales, save the kids, here's a nickel. Like, I'm like, ah! So, you know, there's only so far you can go. You can't outrun all that stuff. Some people maybe have, but I have friends. I know friends who don't barely carry money and that's a bit of an escape i know friends who have the money to do almost anything they want and they have all kinds of things they have to do all the time so the escape idea meditation something i like but it isn't to escape as much as to almost reboot yourself into your same circumstances with a kind of an exalted perspective oh you silly email i'll do you and then there's like 800 more of them but at least the mind is, you're no longer a prisoner of them. It's true. It's true. You, it, it can weigh you down, This these uh, prior engagements or constant badgering of technology. That is, that is true. I've, I, I felt that from time to time. The only thing I would say I noticed, man, is that, like, I don't know if you, when you were, like, six or seven, did you ever have that kind of feeling like I'm a kid? This is the time this I'm like, you knew you wouldn't have that forever. A little bit of that Tom Sawyer, like free and easy living. That was real. You know, when you're under a parent's roof, sure. I had to take out the trash or maybe do some schoolwork, but that childhood experience was pretty, pretty free in my case. Yeah. Had a good, had a good, good, good dose of some really good, good clean fun back then there's a there's a realization to that i i i did have that at, at some point when, when i was a kid maybe around that that age six or seven and i was like oh whoa like this is it like this only comes once in a lifetime like this is it i'm living in being a kid everybody's always talking about being a kid or being an adult and adults want to be kids and i'm that right now I don't, I don't know how you switched up scenery on that, like, like that mid way, way through. And then you just, you just have this, um, Wi-Fi. That's, that's pretty wild. It, it looks good though. Yeah. It's Hawaii. That's one way. Uh, talk about a whole place giving you a nice childlike feeling. Sure. When was the first time that you picked up a guitar? How old were you? 15. My brother gave me some kind of electric guitar that I don't know if it worked. It looked good and it plugged in and I had a little amp and for me uh, that was right when the hormones were kicking in maybe play something for the chicks and then uh, a couple things that were cool about that was uh, you know things like the doors and Led Zeppelin was a goal at that point like those guys and then also who did I know who could play who actually had a guitar and who could play one. And I was growing up in Long Beach. So one guy who gave me tips, Damon Beerhouse, had the high school band named Humongous Butt Fungus. And then I, they became Humongous Fungus. And then I lost touch. Another of my good friends, we were friends or knew these older guys who had a really successful band in Long Beach called Burning Daisy. And they're still around, or the, the humans are. And I ended up getting a 60s Gibson SG through those guys and my friend. And that's like a Robbie Krieger, The Doors guitar. So things got a little serious for me to have that. I worked at Lucky Supermarket, which I think became Albertsons later. And I was able to sort of pay my friend in a few installations to have this legit guitar. And I actually had that guitar for a long time until I ended up uh, trading it in for a pedal steel years later to play with this band Beachwood Sparks. But Long Beach was legit. Like as a freshman in high school, the band Sublime would play our little dances because that was the community at the time. And there was a whole thriving scene of bands. So it was able to 
actually there was music that you would listen to bands that you would listen to but going to shows in your own hometown in long beach those bands we would go see were just as important as something on the radio or something from classic rock it was just in equally interchangeable and that was a really cool thing to have only other thing i'd say about those times was a uh, nwa and Snoop Dogg went to the high school I went to maybe three years ahead of me. So that music came out when I was at that age too. And it all kind of added up. We'd see Sublime at these parties or the cops would come or there'd be a fight. About a 50% ratio of actually them finishing a, more than a few tunes. But that was also a great thing to grow up in. It made it more just being there and what was happening was just as important as a, whether the set finished or not, and B, like I was saying about local bands, it didn't matter how popular they were outside of our region at all. To us, we that was they were the best band in the universe, whoever was playing right then. And I'm glad I had that. Uh, that's informed me to this day. Did it surprise you when Sublime and Snoop Dogg and all these different bands started to become the bands on the radio were you shocked by that or were you like this is the music is very good i knew that from the beginning that they would go on to achieve the success that they have it felt a little different with sublime because i was just going away to college and at that point you almost shed a cloak so when i'd hear them on the radio it was like i wasn't quite the same guy I used to have a shaved head and wear size 52 jeans and a chain wallet, bit of an OC Long Beach kind of a thing. And I would be skateboarding and drinking 40 ounces and smashing them. But I, I got a girl, an incredible girlfriend in college who got me to a, my first Grateful Dead show. She got me more into the beats. I actually switched to a comparative theology minor and kind of got into Eastern religions. But I'd say even with that, maybe No Doubt was a crazy leap because they were a ska band when I used to be in school. And then they kind of went more mega. Sublime still sounded like Sublime. And also, early 90s, K-Rock had a the local station K-Rock from the 80s when the amount of music that was coming out was insane. If you're into that kind of thing, they'd be like, here's a new song by The Cure. Here's a new song by The Smiths. That, you know, just like you'd be like, really? We, we had our goodie bags filled of really cool music as if it was going to always be like that. Maybe it still is. But K-Rock got more corporate later. And I think maybe they've changed again since that. But mid-late 90s, you're getting kind of Limp biscuit corner. <laughs> I don't know exactly what was going on because... By the time I got at KXLU, there was such an individuation of our identity that K-Rock was way mainstream. Some bands like Green Day had started out as KXLU bands and gone all, and they were still cool for us. But Nirvana and even Beck, like you weren't really supposed to play them anymore. And I kind of understand it. I think the ethos was really kind of DIY still then. And there was the idea that they're getting played on the majors and there's all these other bands were the only place you could hear them. So something like KCRW, which is, you know, online now and 89.9, even they were a little bit more posh. So I, as, if I was going to be a DJ at KXLU and I was also going to be a program director, <clears throat> that kind of took me into focusing on other things than I used to in Long Beach too. It took me years to kind of come back to things I grew up on just be, because college radio groomed me a certain way and that was my culture. And then when I, right out of college, I got into the band Beachwood Sparks. And when you're in your early 20s in a band like that, you also really affiliate collectively with what you're listening to, what clothes you have on, even what drugs or it's all kind of another layer. It was pretty cool, you know, but I have enjoyed having lived through those kind of times, being able to just appreciate things and also notice the times when maybe I 
wasn't listening to something anymore because of where I was at the time. Gotcha. Um, what what school did you go to when when you were doing this uh, the KXLU thing for college? That's Loyola Marymount, which is a KXLU, uh, and yeah, it's a cool uh, school. They have a good film program. They had a good recording. I majored in sound recording, and uh, had good experienced teachers and uh, really interesting classmates, and uh, it led to kind of led to a very uh, adventuresome life. Interesting. So right after your time in college, that's when you joined Beachwood Sparks. That was that's right around that time. Yeah, there was a uh, my bandmate Chris and I were the same age, and there was a band. I think you can hear them on streaming and stuff. They were called Further, and that to me that was my favorite band. They just seemed to really understand California culture. And also really have strong connection to things like Dinosaur Jr. and Sonic Youth. And even going so far as to have had something put out on Creation Records, which is England, Alan McGee, Oasis, My Bloody Valentine. So further just, it wasn't that they had those kind of credentials. It's like they sounded super cool. And they still do, in my opinion. Uh, that would be the Rademacher brothers. And Brent and I are still in touch. Beachwood Sparks never broke up. We haven't been active in a while, but he's running the record label Curation out of L.A., and they're they're putting out the album of the Wizards of the West that's about to come out and some other really cool stuff. And so him and I are still in touch, and that ethos that he was having back then is people who know know he still kind of has that kind of cool pocket of sorts. Interesting. Um was was Beachwood Sparks was it the first kind of like quote unquote real band that you were a, a part of that was actually going further than you had been previously in other projects? Yeah, I was in a band called Dr. Sauce that we kind of ruled the keg parties and uh we played the turtle races at Brennan's and I I had a mild aneurysm trying to sing Gratitude by the Beastie Boys. It's like and like i was going down just pointing to my head the band's like when you're pointing to your head we didn't know that means your brain's exploding and you're fainting what do you think we're supposed to do and i had a band called tone deaf before that in long beach and we were gods in our own mind we could do no wrong this we were 19 and invincible so i i was in bands that were fulfilling beachwood sparks had a a period of a lot of hype which was new and we ended up with a different lineup on sub pop records and sub pop was so cool that that gave us several even now it gave us something because the music is in their world and available but at the time it got us around the country it got us around the world and we ended up after a couple years having some cool label mates the closest band to us friend wise and playing together was called the shins and they that was just a really fun time we did i think we did two full laps around the us with them in vans and i really loved that whole band and james mercer a lot so that was cool that sounds very very cool um was it did did it, did it automatically feel different right when you joined that band beachwood sparks that you're like yeah this is gonna we're actually gonna progress further yeah yeah we because we played these shows that were you know right then uh right out of school i moved over to echo park and there was other bands at the time i can't remember them all right off the top of my brain but the ones you might have heard of would be like the Brian Jonestown Massacre and the Warlocks. And it was like a scene. Legitimately, there were bands walking around Echo Park and maybe some of the dudes from the 70s who were still around or the 80s might have been like, who are all these little hipsters? And, you know, I, I'm not, I'm saying that just to be like, I'm not like, we were the shit. But for us, that turn, our turn of the mid, late 90s, that few years, it was vital. There was a lot of artists, a lot of bands. Echo Park had a little edgy vibe. 
and there was places to play and be heard and it it launched us off you know and then when we went around the world the albums we had made kind of got us through some doors that for me were really rewarding and things that just kind of set a good tone had a lot of fun how important is tone within a group of musicians that you're working with for you is that crucial is there, or is that a crucial aspect for you in order to to make the best kind of sound i would say and this is a little it's partially maybe why i'm studying musicians mental health is uh the best band might have a certain tone or a timbre that includes a social timbre and emotional timbre that the even when it's at its best might be destructive it might be harmful to the band members it might be harmful to their close ones or you never know but you know do you want to make art completely safe i don't know if that's possible so the tone is important and in my case the uh, one of the things i've been doing is uh, learning to facilitate a surfing program called waves of grief and uh also in the surfing community when somebody passes away you do a paddle out where everyone's out in the ocean and i guess like at some point i could think of uh seven people seven guys i know who aren't alive anymore and the thing is they're handsomer than me each one of them was handsomer than the last and had great personalities great look to them great music and i don't know that i don't think the tone we set was that destructive compared to some other styles or other bands but nevertheless like i've witnessed a uh, music being a tough road and i don't know if changing that would have made better art interestingly enough is it is it needed to have that strife I mean, for like certain certain bands, like let's say like the Sex Pistols, for instance, did it need to implode in order for it to be what it was? I'm just using that as an example. Yeah, it's such a great question. Uh, my colleague Lauren, who's a musician, Lauren Barth, she plays bass in my band, but she makes her own albums, releases her own records, and we've been we both had like a final paper recently and she did hers on uh joy division and think looking at the particulars of that situation and do you need the strife like i said i think that being a musician even a successful one can just be really tough you might have everything and be alone in your hotel room or your fancy suite or on your bus mm -hmm and be no better off than the someone might be better off who's sleeping on floors but just has other things put together for them so it's almost like i now now that i've been around enough and someone is going to start in a band right now i don't want them to have to walk through the snow it's just like a lot of our heroes in the generation before us or two generations for some from the 60s and 70s so many of them died or had to like we don't have to repeat that to to live up to the legend in fact one of the things that i think is kind of cool and sometimes it might make you even like some people recoil is you know when you see people with punk rock t-shirts available at the mall or you see you see uh viral videos of a little six-year-old girl playing drums to rush but that to me is the evolutionary potential it's not defanging the power of something it's being like i like the little opening scene of finding nemo where there's the manta ray teacher and then there's all the little kid fish and i think uh, a lot of kids these days don't have christian names anymore they just name them whatever they want this is calico this is vienna it's like why not let them play or like the girl with the really clean hair playing uh playing along to nirvana perfectly i don't know if you get those but anytime i'm on instagram i start looking at all these 
videos of people doing stuff. And I'm like, that's like a, I don't want them to have like Nirvana had to bleed and had to be kicked around at school and be like left out to write those things. But why doesn't it now just turn into celebration, you know? And I'm not trying to, sorry if I seem like I'm waxing too uh, philosophical or preaching about it, but it's just, it interests me without me trying to judge it at all. It's just things I notice about this. Just being a, an observer of it, of yeah. it now and of it then, it's an interesting uh, difference. There's differences in, in between these two different phases, I guess, if you will, of, of time within these subcultures. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I think the road with a little more consciousness of from record labels and artists about, you know, caring for one another, that won't take the take the adventure out of being a musician. It'll let us go further with it. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, I, I never I never thought of it like that. Um it's very interesting dave uh let me ask you this though when did you start collaborating i I know that this has been a big part of your history within music is collaborating with other people in their projects and lending your kind of sound to them when did that start to to happen for you when when did people start approaching you and saying hey like you know you you want to be a part of this couple these couple of shows or this show in particular stuff like that I'd say there's kind of a two, there's two main ways that happened. Uh, One was like when Beachwood Sparks got started, there's already so, there's so many guitar players that I got into playing lap steel and also keys. And then with Beachwood Sparks, that put me on the road playing those instruments night after night after night. So what happened is, kind of like a weird uh, amoeba or something. I could kind of sit in with different bands and just play along with what was there. They already had all the people doing their job, but the steel could be more symphonic. And I also got into textural playing, a lot of delays. And so it just, people started having me sit in on their stuff. And it, I, I kind of got used to being adaptable. And another thing is uh, Beachwood Sparks, maybe four to six years in, we never broke up, but that there was one tour and then it was like enough, you know, and uh, I got a chance to make my own record with Sub Pop. It's a record called All Night Radio. And my collaborator, Jimmy, and I spent maybe a year and a half to two years. Felt like being in a rowboat to China. It took a long time. It's very dense, kind of psychedelia. The equipment we had at the time, we pushed to the max. So, like, I would move my computer mouse across the screen and it would just leave a trail of itself. I really fragmented my hard drive as a metaphor and a reality. Like, it just took a lot. And unfortunately, the music came out, got super well received, but we were trying to use backing tracks and it was a little early for that. And also my collaborator and I, it just, it was hard. And so it was sort of the first time as a a ship's captain, my own captain, not being a bandmate, but being kind of the, the leader, I had to sync it. Within a month of that album coming out, I literally scuttled my own ship. And that was traumatizing because I really, really put myself into that music as I went beyond sanity to to make it something. And what ended up happening, it's like a bit of like a good timing and the second part answer to your question, people started asking me to, hey, will you come on the road? So I ended up playing with Jenny Lewis and Jonathan Rice and then did a bunch of other recordings and tours with different people and a bigger tour with the band Interpol who were doing super well at the time. And that was a really good run for us, like really cool. So after that, I got to Venice Beach and put down some roots. I've been collaborating with a guy. We have a project called Californiosos, but then also 
we work out of his music studio in Venice. And so I started doing other things and not being in just a band anymore. And what came out of that was uh, a friendship with Kurt Vile. So I've played on most of his records for a while now. And also I'd been friends with Cass McCombs for a while and uh, collaborated with him and did a project called The Skiffle Players that put out two albums and an EP. But all the while I would be kind of collaborating with people or playing shows or playing on albums in that way. It was more multi multiverse. Very interesting. Those are some good some good names to be playing alongside and with. Yeah, uh, it's pretty much I'd say Jenny and I haven't been in as much touch lately, but Kurt and Cass, those are my favorites anyways, is my point. I've always loved Jenny's writing. I love Kurt and Cass for different reasons or kind of my dudes. So then to be playing with them is like, I don't know. I don't know what the right word is, I, but it's, it's like kind of like dessert. I'm just super stoked. And also it, uh, especially now that I've, I've got an album coming out. I've got a single out, another one coming out in a week or two, and then an album in a month or two. And it's the first music I've written that it's kind of for a new band, but also kind of would reflect for you, you or the listener things I might have been influenced by from Kurt and Cass and from Jenny Lewis and, and some of the other things I've done, including Interpol, because I got a real crash course from them in keyboards and synthesizers and also performing in bigger places. I got to do some pretty wild shows over time. And so this band has a lot of those elements in it, I think, kind of festival type of frequencies and more mature writing. And hopefully it's going to be a, a good trip for everybody. Good deal. When did Farmer Dave and the Wizards of the West begin? When When was that? You're like, all right, this is the new idea i had a band uh i made a solo record i think around 2010 and i had a band put together in san francisco of all things i would drive up there to play and uh also started to pass through big sur a lot which if you've never been to big sur california it's just oh it's just a beating heart i miss it and beautiful uh, beautiful stuff yeah. I did shows, uh, if you're watching or listening and you haven't heard of Folk, yeah, F-O-L-K, that's a West Coast presenter, Britt Govea and his team. They do shows, mostly California. They do an East Coast festival and they do a couple other things, but it's a primarily a California thing. And I've been very active in Folk, yeah, festivals and shows. And there was a version of, I played with a, I did a few shows with one-time bands and one time I had a band called the Wizards of the West back then. But uh, I put together a new version of it in around 2018. We made a record that was kind of more of a live trippy thing. You can hear that one now. It's streaming self-titled FD Wow, which is Farmer Dave Wizards of the West. And that was a different lineup except for my dear friend Ben Knight, Benji, who's in the band now. But this new lineup's kind of a new thing. So it's going to be different even than that album if you seek that album out. That's the one with the uh, the gold on the on the front, correct? It's silver, kind of like or a silver chrome. With yeah, black that, background, that one. Yeah, All that right, baby, yeah, that baby's out. And we do a couple songs from it. And uh, I like it. Uh, yeah, it, it's cool. Yeah, this, it, it is. What, what, what I've heard from it, very, very cool. Um where did the name come from the wizards of the west when wh when did you think of that that one just popped up you know i like i said i think i used that title once up in big sur for a show and it for, forgot about it for a while but it came back and it's kind of nice that it shortens down to fd wow nice for the iconography easier to fit into a bill yeah definitely and also, um, it might be an issue, just large, but it, but it can be large, but it's like you, you have the best of both worlds right there. Yeah, definitely. And it's also people often call me FD 
short for my nickname and the those guys and lady are are the wow very cool um how did how did you go about kind of formulating the new the newest iteration of the wizards of the west did you did you pull from like like i want to work with these kind of people that i've worked with before or funny enough uh the the two major the two major personnel changes in the rhythm section i swear i did these were two occasions when i had had mushrooms and the mushrooms were like put them in your band <laughs> literally i was like okay that's that really did happen for me wow i mean i might have intuited it but i kind of i've been working on that kind of a thing through meditation and you could call it attunement you kind of consider the vibrations of your mind and when things come in you know obviously you want to feel safe and protected you don't want to like jump off a balcony or go eat 20 hot dogs uncooked because something's like eat a hot dog it's more of an attunement thing and my album for all night radio was called spirit stereo frequency something that's been kind of part of my deal the whole time is the idea of attunement so i i can't empirically tell you the mushrooms made me do it but it's like you know whatever was going down that's what i was receiving those ideas in that way and you know i try not to put a giant stamp on what that means how it works or why as much as just enjoy enjoy that and have good intentions and that it works that's a thing. yeah but for me it does yeah it, it's like a radio station of kind of good vibes a kxlu of some sorts yeah but for yourself KXLU, an internal one which is great you, you're never going to be bored that's right. That's right. Um, is it, there's a fixed group of people that you play with now. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. You can hear, uh, Lauren Barth, uh, it, depending when you catch up with this interview, she might have a new record out or she might have several out by the time you hear this, but the, she's got a couple that are out already and a new one called storm waiting where the test pressing of the vinyl came here to the house and sounds really good and uh another fixture on the drums is chad the night snake marshall he's a professional champion longboarder and him and his brothers have a surf shop in malibu and a company called brothers marshall oh They're okay awesome. yeah i've 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 heard of that i've heard that that brand not yeah, um so a, one of the family. brothers marshall is is playing in your band and he's also evolving into a singer he's pretty sexy man and he's got an incredible voice so i like the idea you know trying to make it more community and let everybody really get a chance to sing and as time goes on hopefully write and have more evolutionary possibilities very cool that's a good deal right there um how do you describe the music that you make with the wizards of the west to somebody who has not heard it before what do you what do you usually like to pull from it's kind of like this it's kind of like that what do you what do you usually use in your own words to describe it we describe it uh there's some there's some dancing and kind of festival elements where we play along with beats and things like that but we use words like uh neo psychedelia also west coast or california surf soul psych and uh that sort of the permutations of that that come through it, they come through in different ways i think also we have some twang still some americana and some influences of like i said some of the bands i used to love like say dinosaur junior or sonic youth or like there's a mix of all that stuff and uh you know we have you know still have some contemporary bands that we don't entirely sound like but uh going on in california would be like mapache or the ala laws these both great band. great bands yeah yeah and of course cass cass has sat in with us he's just played guitar in our band which is really cool that is that is really really cool and also uh, katie skeen who she plays on the album and she has her own project and she's super rad very good deal. A good, good, good group of people surrounding this project, if not in it, but around it as well. Yeah. 
Very nice. Um, would the the sound of the Wizards of the West now be different if you hadn't spent time in Beechwood Sparks with Kurt Vile, with Casper Combs, with all these different people that has led up to this? Do, do you think that it would be vastly different and just like way not what it sounds like today? Or would it still kind of sound the same because your influences would be the same? That's a cool question. In fact, thank you. In fact, I would say it's so much connected to that that there is, it wouldn't be able to exist without those things. I've gotcha. often. I've often wondered about it. Uh, if you know, if I would have stuck, if I hadn't been in Beach and Sparks, who knows? Uh, might have been in more of a warp tour kind of a way, or more like uh, I like trippy music. There was a time when Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas produced a single of mine as a demo for London Records, <laughs> and it was kind of like beats with acoustic guitars. I had a thing I might have tried, and it might have worked. You know, you never know. <laughs> I would have liked it if I would have been a little more like Smash Mouth and Sugar Ray. You know, for some reasons, I think that would have been a fun life. Yeah, definitely. I I, I feel like uh, Sugar Ray doesn't get a shine in, in what how cool dudes they are. You know, everyone's yeah. always talking about Smash Mouth. Nobody ever mentioned Sugar Ray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, Even stepping back further from, you know, back then in, in earlier projects do you feel that if uh it, it was your brother right that they gave you the electric guitar that didn't quite work or you didn't know exactly if it worked or not if he hadn't given you that guitar do you think that you would have stumbled upon the guitar in your own life just naturally yeah i played acoustic in my other stuff and i'm sure was an electric would have come along because you could get the boss metal zone pedal for like 50 bucks. I hope they still make that a it's really good. I, uh, I miss that. I miss that kind of, you know, like that distortion in the Radiohead song creep before they come back in. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of just doing that. Uh, Metallica is so sick. Ride the lightning. What about in guitar in general? just even picking it up do you think that you would eventually picked it up if, if it hadn't been handed to you or that you hadn't taken an interest in it uh, when you were 15 yeah i still would have my stepdad had a classical and i remember it playing it in italy this one time just sitting in a green plaza somewhere playing this classical guitar it was a really good life there's been so many times playing all this keyboard if you ever see the wizards of the west now it's like i don't think i can move the camera enough to show you my equipment just this time but i have this like two-tiered l-shaped crazy freaking like beast situation there you see some of it gotcha see the steels on the second row there's two oh wow keyboards there's a melodica up there <laughs> Sorry, it looks messy in the background. I promised my mom I wouldn't show you that. But <laughs> I guess my point is just because you're talking about um, having the uh, guitar. And sometimes when I'm setting this Godzilla up, I say, man, in the next life, I'm just going to be a kazoo player. I'm going to carry one thing to the club, and I'm going to step up and be done. In, in the pocket. But, uh, yeah. One thing we started doing... Uh, is I, I used to play electric guitar in my own bands and haven't been. But uh, lately, I have this Flying V I want to get back into. But for now, a friend of mine passed on an electric 12 string to me. And I've been playing it a little bit in our shows. And it's really sick. So it's like, if I can actually do that, and maybe even like, step away from these gadgets and you can see that i have a body and legs and i could actually move around i've been kind of part of a pile of equipment for most of my professional life either seated or and you know if you want to say like who are your heroes and you say like wow nina simone elton john thelonious monk they don't you know maybe they could 
Actually, I know Thelonious Monk would get up and dance in circles. Really? Sun Ra. Oh, wow. Would go into kind of a Sufi mode. So Interesting. I probably need to do that. I'm feeling a little disembodied, people. Take some, some notes from their book. Yeah. Good deal. Um, do you tend to write alone or with the band? A little of both. Uh, I have a pretty good stockpile of things that are alone. And for anyone who's interested, uh, a lot of the songs that are coming out by me on this new record and a lot of the songs lately uh, almost come out in one take. Like when I'm at home, I'll play it and sing it and it's already complete in one. So they're kind of trippy songs because I don't, maybe they don't have a standard format because of that. But I really like it, and fortunately for me, uh, people like it. I get a lot of good feedback, and the band is stoked on what I'm bringing. So in addition to that, I like to celebrate, hopefully give those guys chances to write for us. And if nothing else, like our new single that's coming out at the time of this interview would be uh, October 21st. 2022 is called Highline and we wrote the music together. I put some words on it, but I want to give the band full credit for that song and hopefully do more that way cuz I think it's a little more rewarding than just bringing stuff in all the time is to write it together and it's also maybe for me evolving past patriarchal top-down notion of a band to something more of a circle you know if possible but again great art can't all be can't all be kumbaya i think you got to fight for it and i don't mean fight but you can't always agree someone might have an idea and so might you and there has to be you know a little bit of an exchange for the best idea to win and that includes learning how not to be too ego based and i haven't learned that it you gotta my i'll be in the shower thinking about the band or thinking about what this person said or you know it's like why am i doing this it's like the serpent brain won't let you rest it'll always find a problem and that's art too that's true um when did you write the songs for the first album that we kind of mentioned before, the, the FD Wow one? They were uh, collected between 2017 and 2018, I would say. There's a song on there called Ocean Eyes that actually we recorded the music for it before, and Kurt Vile plays on a version of that. I made an EP called Speak of Love, just under my solo name, and Kurt plays on some of that people don't know. And uh, I think Cass is on there a little bit, too. And that was my uh, been to Peru, had the ayahuasca, gonna save the world EP. And uh, still working on that. Awesome. Um, there is a cover, though, of the Ventures Wipeout that closes out that album that not your um, your Farmer Dave solo stuff, but the first album for the Wizards of the West. And I wanted to know what what made you want to cover that song specifically? What was the what was the thing like we gotta do this one? Our drummer at the time, his name is Judd. He's such a character. He won Survivor. He's just like <laughs> an extremely unique, unique individual. And I think, you know, this came about myself and maybe Benji still had a little bit of a Mr. Cool thing. Not always, but he would say like at practice, he'd be like, Hey, we should play Wipeout. And just be like, Man whatever bro and he kept saying it so finally i think this was like weeks and weeks later i was like fine you want to play wipeout you want to play wipeout fine and what i did if you ever hear the version i made it like goth depeche mode where the chords are minor and they keep going down over that famous riff and the reason i did it was just to be like it wasn't that i was like he was just reacting to him. I thought it was a ridiculous idea. And of course he was right. But I mean, it, it came about out of just like sheer exasperation and kind of trying to mustache the Mona Lisa 
of this thing. And then we ended up loving it. I, I'll never forget some of the reactions we've had playing it where the whole place is dancing like a Cindy Lauper video. Or I mean, it's, I've seen <laughs> things that look like a movie because of that. It is it is an interesting take on the song. And for those who haven't listened to it, go definitely go check that out. Um, and it's, it's an interesting way to kind of sign off the album is it's 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 way way at the end there and it's very very interesting yeah Uh, and it's almost like halloween six or the evil dead like just when you thought we were done with it this version of the band i think because we still i we all surf there's a there's surfing involved and we just thought maybe so many of our songs is something from my little world so they say, why don't we try to play it again? And lo and behold, this band's playing it, same thing. Everything get it kind of just everyone starts getting rowdy. It it's uh I think it's good, you know. Whether or not you you know, like bands like the Beatles and they, they all started playing tons and tons of covers as they were learning and to write themselves. So I think throwing something that's that indistinguishable from just breathing air it's so famous it lets people in the crowd go like ah, and they start going crazy <laughs> uh what genre of music has had the greatest impact on the music that you make that's a great question uh, it's you. a bit of a hybrid though uh i have to say that uh you know that sort of the mu- the african-american music experience is huge and that includes jazz and spiritual jazz and hip hop largely was big. It's a big part of my day. And then at the same time, that music of like the sixties, like the beach boys, the birds and Buffalo Springfield, which is California music is super huge. And then now in between the music of England, the kind of, the i guess you'd say that hybrid like happy mondays primal scream my bloody valentine all that music from england when i was young still super hyped on it and 80s music where there's all the sound effects and big production sydney lopper your favorite yeah benji likes her a bit more i think like just the fact like always something there to remind me it goes or owner of a lonely heart where it's like there's all these expletives all the time i got used to thinking music should have all this candy in it and i never got rid of that i think i still want to hear candy you you want candy i I understand um i I, i've heard that one it's also a good one Dave, it's been an absolute pleasure sitting and chatting with you, and I appreciate you coming on. But before I let you go here, we got some promo. So Farmer Dave in the Wizards of the West music is streaming everywhere. The This this album that we've been talking about that has been released, that's everywhere, wherever the people get their music, that's where they can find your music? Yes. Awesome. Yes, it's everywhere. There's one song of our new stuff called Ohana, and there's a video you can see, too. We made a cool video. That's yeah. out. There's a song called Highline coming out in two weeks of this time. And the album Second Summer will be out everywhere November 18th. And soon after, they're pressing the vinyl in Sweden right now. So it's going to be beautiful. This artist you might be interested in called Thomas Lynch III did the cover. And his work's really beautiful. So it's going to be a nice physical document that'll really be a nice addition just to have physically but it'll be available digitally in less than two months oh awesome and that's that's through creation records right that's who's yeah. putting it out awesome and, and, and what was the release date on that one more time just, just for the folks at home for the highline, highline for, single mm-hmm. october 21st ohana out now and second summer november 18th November eighteenth is is when the whole album's coming out and that's yeah i i, I did check that the single out and um for those of you who are w- uh, watching this, um, the link will be below to go check that um, that new video out because it is good. I, I-, I like it. And um, you can stay up to date with all of Farmer Dave's and the Wizards of the West kind of news and what have you at um, 
on Instagram, right? That's the best place. Yeah. If the, if, if, if all you out there use Instagram, that's a main, main hub for me. You can write me at timeless Dave. There's a little picture of axolotl and I'll be happy to hear from you. Awesome. Good deal. And uh, you, you can follow the band at farmer dave and the wizards right that's and that's right. yeah that's and it we, on instagram yeah we've we've got shows and we keep you up to date about that stuff good deal and at the website too right that's that's also uh, if you're not on the instagram that's fd and wow.com right yeah that's best that's place fairly up to date too good deal uh is there anything else that we're missing here no you've done a great job uh Thank you. FD and Wizards on the Twitter, but that's a, it's a little redundant to be honest. You know, it it probably is a repost of one of the other guys. And I don't know about you. I mean, do you do you do the TikTok? I I'd love to. I don't know when I would do that, but I'd I do not do the TikTok or the Twitter, but I I have I appreciate you mentioning that. Are you guys on TikTok? Are you guys going to do it? It's a fundamental presence. I wish if you said to me, "Dave, spend all day making weird stuff." I would that's what I would be doing right now but I'm in grad school man and it may take some time for the TikTok but Instagram is is our main currency when the wizards of the west are on TikTok you'll know about it because you're following them on Instagram they're going to post about it it'll there all you tie go. together someday there you go Dave thank you again for coming on sir I appreciate it and um, I'll talk to you in a minute I'm going to stop recording this all right thanks it's been a pleasure goodbye thank everybody. you <laughs>